One of the best sports events that's going to happen this weekend is the knockout match between Wexford and Clare. And I'm delighted to say James Skell is here with us to help preview that and all the rest of the weekend's games. James, good morning to you. How are you getting on? Morning, guys. How are you? Good. Uh, before we get into that, just one quick point. Um, the minor championship last night, Cork beat Clare by 40 points. This is not something that we're used to seeing in any teams, really, no. particularly in Munster at that age group. Sometimes a brilliant age group comes together and another county has a slightly younger or weaker or these things happen from time to time but 40 points is kind of worrying isn't it it's huge like i, I remember um watford had a dream team going back in 2013 with the likes of isaac leeson and they were playing go in the final and uh, that, that margin of defeat was seven or eight points and we thought that was a huge huge margin and you know, look at last night's result and it just kind of screamed two counties that are on completely two different planes two different trajectories entirely cork seemed to be putting all the right systems in place with another 20 championship one uh, the minor victory is is pretty, you know, it's it's, it's pretty worrying if, if as a hurling fan, um, but if I'm if I'm a Clare fan, I'd be questioning what's going on there inside with structures from an underage level up. If you watch Twitter and you watch kind of interactions amongst Clare people who will be, I suppose, have, have their best interests at heart at board level and also at, at club level, um, there's a lot of concerning information coming out there with regards to what structures have been put in place over the last, you know, seven or eight years that has now culminated in this kind of this kind of defeat and. It's demoralising for the group of players themselves. That's why I feel sorry most for, um, because they, they, they probably you know they weren't expecting such a, a, a defeat of large margins, and, and here they are after getting beaten by forty points. It's a terrible state, to be honest. Yeah, and look, not to labour this point too much, but obviously when they moved the minor grade to under seventeen, and I totally understand why they did that. For a lot of players on that team, this is going to be their last ever intercounty action, yeah. and some might be lost to the system, some might be lost to the game when these type of of defeats are handed out. So you'd hope that Clare get a handle on it sooner rather than later. Um, yeah. Notwithstanding that, there's a big chance for Clare this weekend to take a big scalp and to catapult the senior team forward. What's your expectation about what's going to happen between Clare and Wexford this weekend? Um, I, I, the fixture is obviously going to be dominated by, by, by off the field issues with regards to, to the two managers. Um, I think from a game perspective, I, I, first of all, I was delighted to see that Fergal Horgan has been awarded the game because he's the right type of person to deal with everything. He's, de he's the right type of person to deal with, deal with the, the high-paced game. An intense game is going to be an awful lot on the line. You lose your out, obviously. He's the right type of person to deal with any drama that happens on the sideline. He's such an experienced referee. So, first of all, Fergal Harlan, great appointment there. Um, the second thing then was Turles to pitch. Um, it's it's an expansive type pitch, and I think it'll suit Clare a bit, a bit more, if I'm honest. Um, I'm expecting a clear victory. I think they're, they're like a wounded animal at this stage now with regards to the loss. Um, you know, last week, uh, or the week before, should I say, and they're the only team like, that has had a championship victory, and here they are after getting kind of the short straw. So I feel for them a bit, and I think they're going to be well up for the game. But they, they understand an awful lot at, at stake. They're probably their preparations over the last fortnight have been drowned out by, obviously, the managers and also with the penalty decision from, from a couple of weeks back. So I think as a player, they'll be itching to get going. And then Wexford, who knows that they, with, with the battle they had with Kinney two weeks previous, there could be some tired bodies, some injuries. So I, I'm expecting a clear victory. The, the Wexford performance against Kilkenny, I think, surprised a lot of people. The, the, um, the fact that they were able to get back to the level they were at in, in 2019 was something that we weren't sure was going to happen. And because it did happen, how, how much confidence will the group of players take from the fact that they were able to execute a game plan against it? A side that a lot of people still think are one of the genuine contenders for this All-Ireland. Yeah, look, I, I suppose in my, in my pre-championship uh, rankings, I had Kikini and Tip equal on three and four. Um, so if I was saying Kikini would be number four, and Wexford put it up, it was, still, it, was, it was a really good game on Wexford's behalf. Um, I'm not trying to be dismissive or negative towards them, but they, they still lost the game. <laughs> so they lost the game, and say, which, which as, a, like, as a player, like, is, is difficult to take. Yes, you can go toe-to-toe, -to -toe and there's, there's somewhat moral victories, but I think if Wexford win toe-to-toe, -to -toe, with the likes of a Limerick, they, they would take an awful lot more confidence out of that type of game than going touch over Kikini, who they had beaten regularly over the last number of years. Um, so they will take some confidence in that they execute the game plan, I would imagine, to how they wanted to. Um, they've got their good players playing relatively well, although I think Conor McDonald's they need to get more out of him in at 14. Um, and they, they they have a good run into it, you know. They'll be well psyched for the game. They, they, they've played in Thurles a number of times. This, this group of players, I say, they've got on relatively well. So I think it's going to be a very challenging game for Wexford if they're trying to. I, I'm I'm anxious to see what kind of weather is going to be because if it's quite it's quite hot, Thurles tends to be a real hot pitch. I know that was that might quite make sense, but when you're down on the pitch in Thurles, it, it's 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 nearly hotter on the pitch than it is in the stands. Obviously, from a shape perspective, but if they're trying to implement a game plan, 
that is high intense, high running, a lot of mileage, uh, the weather may have may, may have an impact also. So that that remains to be seen. What what is Claire's style at the moment? How how are they different under Lowen than they would have been, say, under Davy? Yeah, good question. Um, it's kind of a phrase whereby you can put the you can put the dog in the fight, but you can't put the fight in the dog. And when I look at Brian Lohan, it's like it kind of look at their defence. And yes, they, they mightn't have the most beautiful hurlers with, with regards to, to style, but they've got six guys at the back who who are kind of very very tenacious in the in the way they defend. They defend as a unit. They defend together, and I, I, I really like that, you know. And they've, they they kind of show traits of what Brian had himself as a player, where they're really aggressive in the tackle. They're really they're, they're playing for each other. They're supporting each other. And they're doing all the donkey work at the, from from basically number from number two to nine to create chances for the for the guys up front. And then if there's a turnover up on the front, you can see a great level of, of ambition from the clear forwards to get it back. You know, their 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 intensity levels is massive. And I think from from uh, if you were to contrast the styles, I would say Claire's style under under Fitzy was more tactical, maybe analytical. And then if you look at from from Lawrence approach, it's more pride, jersey, aggression intensity you know so I, I, it's just i just wonder can can they mix the two together to get to get a really good team put in place and i i, I would think this year obviously they're, they're they're making great strides at the start of the year we wouldn't have said that obviously but i think next year we're going to see great fruition of, of the records over the last last couple of years but <clears throat> i think you see an awful lot of similarities the way Lohan played himself he was a pure heart on sleeve lad helmet tilted back and here's my head you know the rest is coming that's kind of the way he was head first into everton that's the way I see the kind of clear boys are going at the moment. And of course, I, I, the, we can't preview the game without talking about the form of Tony Kelly and the potential for, for him to run riot. Like, what, yeah. what will the plan be from a Wexford perspective? Because I think it was a bit of a surprise to see him start where he started the last day. And I don't know if that was, if that's done deliberately just to kind of throw off the pre-match plans and the markings. And then it's, Kelly essentially plays quite free from that point forward. Yeah. What do Wexford do, and what did Clare do with him this weekend? Do you think? Yeah, like, generally when you, when 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 you play Wexford, they they tend to put Matthew O'Hanlon on the kind of their their key man. So a couple of weeks ago, they put him on TJ and kind of told him to follow follow TJ wherever he goes, and it kind of suited because TJ TJ is not the most pacey forward, and to be honest, neither is Matthew. But Tony Kelly is a completely different proposition entirely. Like he's got an engine that that can stay going all day and 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 tr- tremendous speed. So I, I'm not sure. Is Matthew the right man to take to take him up there? I'd be wondering is a is a, a guy with, with legs like Jim O'Keefe the guy to just to stick with Tony Kelly wherever he goes. Like Jim Jim O'Keefe has got a great engine, great fitness. Um, he's got uh, he's got a good brain, he's got experience. So maybe he'd be the guy to to get on Tony. The only thing is though is that if he goes into the full forward line or specifically full forward, that he should be, you know, it's it's a different kettle of fish playing full back as a guy like Jim O'Keefe was used to playing midfield or wing back. So they might have to do a switch over there with um with Liam Ryan who's who's a tremendous hurler as well. But it's 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 the freedom role. Like Tony, like he's such a good hurler. If you can keep him inside uh, the opposition sixty-five, not have him going back too far, because it's just it has a negative impact on the team because you don't get the same kind of, I suppose, benefits of having him back behind his own sixty-five. You keep him inside the opposition sixty-five, and you basically tell him go where you want to go, just pop up where you want to pop up, you know. And like he he'll do the damage for you. It's kind of the good players. You kind of have to give them the license to do what they want. There are certain elements of tactics and certain types of shapes and formations that yes, the team will have to. To abide by for 80 percent of the game but a person of tony kelly's <clears throat> potential to say to, to to influence the game just let him go wherever he wants you know and like, it seems to be a bit of the game plan too is having aaron shanahan in at 14 and just lumping it in there and see how it works um and I, i'm a fan of that too because it just creates a small bit of pandemonium a bit of chaos it's not too structured so as a defense you can't really defend it because you, you just lamp it in see where it goes shanahan is a big man he's fantastic in the air and like, who knows what comes off it. So having Tony Kelly with a free license could, do, could, could work wonders for Clare on Sunday, Saturday. It was 115 he scored in November in the, the last championship match between these sides. I think Matthew O'Hanlon was marking him for a lot of that. So you're, you're probably onto something that they might go for a different person. Mm-hmm. Did they go for people, uh, James? Like, is it worth double marking Tony Kelly? Uh, I don't think so. I think if he's, if he's, because if you play an expansive forward line and you go double marking, it's not like a club level where you can kind of nearly double mark a person and you can afford to lift someone off free. But... Mm-hmm. If, it depends. If Wexford play with a sweeper type person, then you can double mark. You know they're obviously going to have let's say five forwards up the front and two slash three midfielders with potentially seven backs if they try to adopt that that game. But I think with, with the way the Wexford management team will look at the game and Fitzy knows David Tony Kelly well is if you can stop Tony Kelly, if you can relatively stop him, 
you know, if you can stop him from play, yes, he'll score his freeze and he'll get maybe a sideline, but you know, he'll be, he'll have influence there. So he's going to come away with a minimum ten points, no matter what happens. But can you stop the ten points going to fifteen points, as you said there? You know, those five points where he'd be influential from play or where he's assisting guys, can you stop that? And like so, Fitzy will know full well if you stop the influence Tony Kelly, you go an awful long way to stop and clear. So he might potentially put in seven backs and have the sweeper roaming in front of Tony to cut off the supply. As you can see, what Claire do is, as I said a minute ago, they pump the ball into Aaron and obviously see what happens with the breaks. But they play a lot line into the corners to, into Tony Kelly into space. So maybe the sweeper would stand on that section. Wherever Tony Kelly is, stand that section and try to cut out the supply. And that goes a long way then for Wexford stop and Claire. Does the ongoing feud between Brian Lohan and Davy Fitz have any impact on preparation going into a game like this? Um, that's a, it's, it's a hard one to tell because, you know, like it's very well publicised. You know, it's gone on a couple of years now. It's gone back as far as 2014 from the Fitzgibbon days, you know. And um, there's been a couple of games, games in college which really has, has culminated in here we are now with, with the the two counties. Um, I, I I don't think so. I think it's the more is made out of it in the media. And if I'm honest, right, I was speaking to a person yesterday and he was saying, Geez, I think they'd be good friends from their county days. And I was kind of going, no, not really, because, like, me personally, if I if, after coming out, leaving off a county team, I probably have five or six, you know, friends, like really, guys you call on, you know, to go to the bog with you. Do you know what I mean? And then you have the the 90% is you'd be, you know, you'd meet, you'd, you'd be civil, like, so you'd be, I wouldn't call it friendly, but you'd be civil. Then you'd have a few that you wouldn't be friends with. And I think Johan and Fitzy are in the last bracket. They're, they're not quite friends. I don't think from a relation perspective, you know, they ever touch base outside of outside of hurling or when, you know, when they finish. So I don't think it makes a, a huge difference. I think from a Clare perspective, it makes no difference. Or from a, from a Wexford perspective, it makes no difference because it's more of a, it's it's pulling at the Clare heartstrings. But again, the championship is coming, lads. It's 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 business. So whatever is going on, let's say on the sideline, leave it there on the sideline. Let the media do what they want to blow that kind of up, let's say, and, and, and fill, fill some column inches or from screen three inches. But from a player perspective, it's it's business and, and forget what's going on after that. James, you you hurled under Davy, right? Uh, I think at, at college, did you win if it's given? Yes, yeah, we did. We so did with a fantastic team, no seven, yeah. And and it sounds like over the conversations we've been having, you're you're quite ambivalent about him as a manager or or what he brings. There there must be something there. What like in the whole, what what are the the good parts about his management? Um. I think he's. I think he's managed for ten years. Uh, they, they could only really last, if I'm honest, two to three years per team. I think he's the great motivator at the very beginning. So he's he kind of you know like an army approach where you're all motivated together and you're heading towards towards the war, let's say. But there's a, then there's a certain man management style and a certain approach you have to have with adults, you know. And I don't. I think that that approach is not quite there as time goes on into year two and certainly into year three, etc. Um, he's, so motivation is, from from the off is his very good point. Um, tactically, he's he also surrounds himself with really good people. So you've got a great management team when he comes towards you. You know you, you've got a very professional base. You know throughout let's say through SNC nutrition everything. So when I, that was where I got my first exposure exposure of real professionalism in sport. I, I was with the county team at the time, but I also with the club with the, the with the college team. And the county the college team was ahead of the county team in terms of preparation, personnel, you know professionalism as a whole. So I got that's what I witnessed. So I think he brings that. Um, I, I, the, what, he, what, he, what he also brings in is, you know, he brings a focus to certain areas that you don't quite like, you know, so off the pitch, off the pitch stuff as, as we see. Um, and just, it's man management, guys, for me. I know I, I, this may sound very bad, let's say, but I just don't agree with the way he manages people, manages adults, you know. Um, it's, it's more like a, maybe like a principal type student relationship whereby. In, in modern day hurling, where you've got very, very intelligent people, you know, on, on both the sideline and on the pitch, let's say it's more of a collective approach. And if you look at the way the counties operate in the line of Cork and Galway and Tipperary, you get a real sense that they're all kind of heading the one approach, that they're all together, you know, uh, or in the same boat, you know. Whereas with, with, with teams that Fitz is involved with, it's like he's kind of the CEO and the rest of you will follow, you know. Sounds a bit harsh, but. Well, and has that changed at all, do you think, over the years? Because the, the Wexford lads, like, yeah. you, you know, like. Some very, but there's some very impressive people on that team. Like Matthew Hanlon is one of the most impressive GA people I've I've met. You know, Lee Chin is very yeah. impressive. Anytime you kind of hear and speak and and talk about that, and then even some of the rest of them have, have gone out and set up their own businesses in, in recent years. So, and I don't know if that in any of that matters, right? 
Um, mm. But it seems like they're not the type who would just sit there and go, yeah, 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 exactly. We'll do exactly what you want. Mm. It seems like they're the type who would have questions and would bring that rigorous self-analysis that you clearly had to, to conversations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What if I said to you that uh, if I was a manager and I maybe, this is going to be slightly controversial now, but I'm going to say it anyways. Uh, if I picked out the pillars of the team, let's say, and man managed them well, would the rest follow? You would think that, yeah, that there's like a, a structure there. And and are you asking those no, pillars? No, if, if I asked you, if I, if I was a manager and I picked out the main pillars of the team, players would probably carry the most influence also, and I man manage them well, would the rest of the follow? The answer is categorically yes, 100%. 100% they will. Do you know, and that's, I look at, as I said to you, slightly controversial, but that's kind of where my head is at when it comes to that kind of type of management style. Okay. I do, and yeah. now you would prefer if actually everybody got equal treatment because, you know, it's not that just that it's democratic, it's ultimately you don't know that the, the big decision in the last minute of the game isn't going to fall to somebody who you don't have a relationship with unless you've been equal in your time and efforts. Yeah, I think in, any, in a business, in a team, uh, in a work environment, Anthony, I think if you're a member of a team, uh, you want to feel valued and responsible. So valued in what you bring to the team and responsible in what you can deliver for the team. You know, and I think if everyone feels that in a team, so everyone across the board, that's from, from the guy who does the logistics to the person who does the nutrition to the guy who opened the gates and the pitch, if they feel valued and responsible, you get a much more, you get a much higher level of output and productivity. So I think if you've got a team whereby, and I keep using Limerick, no, so apologies for that. And I just get, I get the overriding sense that every person in that group feels valued and responsible. And hence, you see the, the, what, what uh, the accolades they're, they're getting now. Well, I know in... I can just use the 17 approach for Galway. I can say categorically, everyone in that area, from checks to kickman to the bus driver, everyone was valued and responsible when I mean, they were I do wonder how important it is that um, it's in in Limerick scenario and in the Galway scenario that you, you pointed out there, that there's a long-term relationship. I, I, look, Davey's done remarkable things for Wexford Hurling on the basis that they were not really a credible All-Ireland contender and now they are an, a credible All-Ireland contender. So I, I can see how the question I'm about to ask is a bit dumb. Outside managers generally, as a rule, if you're trying to build a culture and something that's going to be sustainable in the long term, I'm not sure that that actually works in the GAA because of the parochial nature of it, because of the like, how, how can you have a long-term relationship with the kit manager and the bus driver and the people who are opening the gates and all of the training grounds? Maybe you can stay for long enough, and, and David's certainly there long enough, and he would put, potentially argue that actually he does know all those people now because of the relationship that he has. But I think about, I think about like, football counties that are trying to make it from one tier to the next tier, and I, I just see the short-termism that Kildare have had for 30 yeah. years, for example. It's never been sustainable because they've never done it internally. They invested in Mick O'Dwyer, they invested in McGinney, they're investing at the moment in Jack O'Connor, and it's like, well, yeah. maybe that changes the culture of the, the club, but it doesn't feel like it is a long-term thing. And it's interesting that you do keep going back to Limerick, and it's a Limerick man who's, who's kind of driving that, and obviously, Canerk is important, yeah. but um, anyway, sorry, that's my ramble. What do you think of that? Well, it's, quite, it's a very good point, and I, I, I do agree with you. Um, I think that you know, counties who, who engage in Galway footballers did it as well when they brought down the fellow from Arama, is it Kernan? What's it, Joe Kernan? Was that he? You know, they, they started that. We did it with Jurlock Mann in the hurlers back in, in 07 time. And, you know, I think if a person comes into a county team uh, and has to be really successful, he needs to surround himself with good people. So if you're going to be an external manager, you have to have the lay of the land inside from a club perspective. So your selectors and even all the logistics people, all the people I've named before, should be from the county. You know what I mean? If you're the head of the the head, like the head of the whole um, pyramid, to say, you can be from an outside county, in my perspective. But I, I agree with you. Uh, the people, counties who are successful, their managers seem to be ingrained into the whole county, into the club scene, into the, the people. You know, there's a, there's, a, there's a broad and global understanding of how things operate there and areas that have to focus on and influence to change, you know. Um, and so we keep referencing Limerick, and here we are. And Jim Gavin in Dublin, the same thing. He, he changed the culture, putting people around him, and next thing, the ball started rolling, it became a snowball effect, you know. So um, I do think you're on something very interesting there. How did your Galway setup in 2017 differ from the LIT setup in the late 2000s under Davy and under Michal Donahue? Good question. Um, so, so Galway kind of set up in 17 um, 
had numerous people who had influence over the team. So you take Lucas, you know, Lucas Kirstenstein, the SNC coach, that was his area. So, and, and I, I, I would strongly imagine that, that Michal or Noel or Franny, they wouldn't dive into that area. That's Lucas's area. That's his area of expertise. And who are they to say? And then you go to the physio department with Jave Hanley, and that was his area. And everyone had their area. And I think what Michal and the guys did really well is with it, they trusted, entrusted people, let's say, in their areas to carry out the responsibilities to the best of their ability. So that, that let each person thrive. It goes back to the value versus responsibility. So Lucas would have known straight off that he is full responsibility for the FNC, and hence he's there because of his value. And you can see this kind of the, the size of player that was bred from Lucas. You know, guys increased kilos, three, four, five, six kilos over the course of the year, which ultimately led to an Ireland. And I think that kind of system that Miguel put in where there was delegation, and he was the quote before, you know, the secret to good business delegation, that's what was put in place. And everyone got behind it. Every, players stuck to playing, you know, and then the people on sideline did their job. So everyone came together. And it was a united effort. That's the way I feel about it. Um, from a Fitzy Fortune College, it was very much that he was the main guy. He was the main guy. So he would do team talks. He would do, you know, all the, the, tra the training drills. He would do the tactical analysis. He would do the psychology. He would do the logistics with setting up. He would do the physical training. You know, so there was an awful lot of things going on there. And I understand the budgets maybe would be different in college from county. So maybe he didn't have the personnel and it was different, different tenure as well. But to summarize, it was very, very much a, a broad collective approach in Galway and more of a, a single-minded we follow approach in, in LIT, if that makes sense. It sounds like that was a pretty happy time in Galway to be involved in that panel at, at the stage yeah. of your career that you were at, where you were able to recognise the, the progress that this manager was, was bringing by giving everybody that responsibility. Yeah, like, and he, like, he, he convinced me to stay. I was leaving, I was leaving the panel at the... Oh, at the end of the 2015 season, wasn't it? Yeah, I was leaving. I was, I was actually going to London. I had a job lined up there. I was, I was heading off, you know, and in January 15. Um, and then he convinced me to stay. And then ironically, then the way things work out, three weeks later, four weeks later, my mother got sick. So I would have had to come home anyway. So just things had a way of working out, you know, and had a way of, of fixing themselves as such. So I, I, owe, I owe a lot to him for keeping me here, you know, keeping me interested. And then the, just the whole thing took off. And... It was kind of a combination of an awful lot of people's efforts over the course of a number of years. And it's it's something that you try to find is called a sweet spot. So you, you, when you're in a team that you know, you just know it's going to be successful. It's the same in LRT, to be honest, because of the group of players we had. You just know you're going to win. You know, if that, and you're going to say how, but it's very hard to explain because we prepared well, we played well, we got a bit of luck. But everyone in the team, everyone in that environment was contributing in a positive manner and they're all heading forward. There was no one pulling back, pulling the reins back. There was no one link in the chain that was going to cause a break. It was just a sweet spot. And then you go, in, in, in all the teams prior to that, let's say, and after, there wasn't quite the sweet spot. You know what I mean? So uh, where, where something would go wrong, some guy could get, could get injured and you could lose him and he could be, you know, that could be detrimental to the team. Whereas in 17, everything just kind of went, went the way we needed to go. <laughs> yeah. Look, there's a million different things that we could... Um spend about 25 minutes discussing that we've touched on in this conversation. So maybe we'll, we'll do it again soon, but yeah. uh, we didn't even preview the Munster and, and Leinster hurling finals. <laughs> <laughs> Did you give us quick tips or something? Yeah, come on, give us, give us winners. So you, you, you think Clare are going to beat Wexford. Um, Kilkenny, yeah. Dublin. I think Kilkenny are going to beat Dublin. I think it's going to be a tight affair, but I can see Kilkenny winning by six or seven. Okay, and then in the Munster hurling final, what's going to happen? I think it's going to be an absolute warfare for the first half. And I think the Limerick is going to just grind it out and beat it by a couple of points. Right. All good games. All very good games. And we get All to very good games. Yeah, and and yeah. the, the Joe McDonough Cup final, most importantly, James, who's uh, who's coming out on top in that one? I'm going back with Smith in that one. Okay. Um, Paul Arkham, who was involved with the club this year, was over with him. Okay. David Dinner you know, always playing. And uh, that's a different topic entirely. Kerry, if they win that, they switch Lens as opposed to their own problems. So yeah. don't start me in that one. <laughs> uh, tipping Westmead is an immediate ban from OTB AM. Yeah. <laughs> uh, only, only on Thursdays, but I think on Fridays you get, a, you get garlanded. Good stuff, James. Great to have you with us. Thanks a million. Okay, folks. Good day. Right. That was brilliant. That's James Cahill with us uh, at this stage almost every week. And um, I don't know, there's a million different things that I want to ask there about that go away setup yeah. and how they eventually got over the line. So we'll do that at some point when there are less pressing matters. Two minutes past nine. OTBAM is brought to you by Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette. Put your best face forward with their new and improved razors. 